Welcome. My name is Dr. Jean Elwing, and I'm a professor of medicine and a director of the pulmonary hypertension program at the University of Cincinnati. And I will be talking with you today about pulmonary arterial hypertension, the diagnosis you don't want to miss. And we really want to thank our sponsors, United Therapeutics, Bayer, and Actillion for supporting this very important program. I do have some disclosures listed here, both research and consulting. So what do we wanna learn from this program? We wanna describe the important signs and symptoms of pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary arterial hypertension specifically. We wanna know the patient populations who we should screen and list appropriate screening and diagnostic tests for these patients and describe the benefits of early referral to a pulmonary hypertension center of excellence. So let's start. Unfortunately, Despite our medications, pulmonary hypertension remains a chronic, progressive, usually fatal condition. It starts in the pulmonary vasculature when you have pulmonary arterial hypertension, and this increases pulmonary pressures, and it is not from increased left-sided filling pressures. It's truly from the pulmonary vasculature, and this results in the right ventricle getting stronger, thicker, and then weaker over time and results in right heart failure and ultimate patient demise. So we need to stop this cycle, intervene as soon as we can to make a big impact. So let's talk about how we define this condition. And we're gonna be working through the new ERS ESC guidelines throughout this talk. So important because there are some changes to be aware of. So the new ERS ESC guidelines endorsed the new definition of pulmonary hypertension that was proposed by the World Symposium. Resting pulmonary hypertension is defined as a mean pressure greater than 20. And when you have precapillary disease, disease from the pulmonary vascular bed, the left-sided filling pressures are in that normal range, 15 or less, and the resistance in the circuit is elevated at greater than two. If you have isolated postcapillary disease, the pressure is coming from the left heart, extra filling pressures, that wedge is elevated greater than 15, and the PVR should be in the normal range, two or less. If you have combined disease, multifactorial disease, you'll have a high pressure, high left-sided filling pressures with that elevated wedge more than 15, and increased resistance in the circuit with a PVR greater than two. And exercise-induced pulmonary hypertension was defined in these new guidelines as a mean PA pressure over cardiac output slope between rest and exercise of greater than three millimeters of mercury per liter per minute. So those are the new definitions proposed by ERS ESC. So now let's break them down into the big groups. And we're all familiar with this. And the new changes are seen here in red as recommended by ERS ESC. So we still have the five big groups, as I mentioned, pulmonary arterial hypertension, pulmonary hypertension associated with left heart disease, lung disease, chronic obstructions, as well as unclear or multifactorial mechanisms. But what has changed? In group one, they divided out the idiopathic patients to those who respond to vasoreactivity testing and those who do not. And they added those patients who have venous and capillary involvement. In group two, they divided heart failure to preserved ejection fraction and those with reduced ejection fraction. And they added a big group of congenital or acquired cardiovascular conditions with post-capillary pulmonary hypertension. In group three, they redivided obstructive lung disease, restrictive lung disease, mixed hypoventilation and hypoxia without lung disease or developmental lung disorders. And then in group four, we kept this as pulmonary hypertension with chronic thromboembolic disease, but now the title is pulmonary hypertension associated with pulmonary artery obstructions. And group five is subdivided, better defined into hematologic, systemic, metabolic, chronic renal failure, tumor, thrombotic, angiopathies, and fibrosing mediastinitis. So just some more clear groups and definitions were proposed. But regardless of how we classify it, when we look at our PAH patients, they have a similar problem. Their pulmonary vasculature is changing. Their pulmonary vascular resistance is rising. And because of that, the pulmonary pressures are increasing. 
until a point when the right ventricle can't compensate and it becomes dysfunctional. And then the pulmonary pressures actually can decrease and the cardiac output starts to decline. So we see this continuum of disease and we want to act as soon as possible. That's why we don't want to miss this condition. So what are some of the challenges getting our patient who is dysmic to the diagnosis? Well, first is dysmia is hard. There's so many things that can make you dysmic. Acute or chronic shortness of breath is a common reason to see your primary care physician. But when to refer is difficult. When do we know to go down the route of a pulmonary disease, a cardiac condition, or even pulmonary hypertension? We have to look at the whole picture, and hopefully we'll be able to do that through this lecture. So there's some things that can help drive us. Cardiac causes, we can think of rhythm disturbances, signs of heart failure, pericardial disease, or congenital heart disease. If we're looking at pulmonary diseases, we're thinking of the patient who is more wheezy, chest tightness with uh, difficulty with exposures to chemicals and smells and things of that nature. Or we could have lung cancer history or pulmonary emboli or previous exposure to radiation or even kyphoscoliosis or something of the sort that could limit your ability to ventilate. And then we have these other conditions that can make you dysmic that are in the background that we have to think about and rule out. Thyroid disease, anemia, dysfunctional breathing, deconditioning, elevated BMI, myopathies. But most commonly, your dysmic patient is going to land in the cardiac or pulmonary side. And I think that's really important to remember when we're doing this workup. So what are the barriers to getting from dysmia to the answer? Well, there's no clear guidelines. There's no clear evidence or algorithms of how to approach all patients because each patient is so different. Symptoms overlap and more than 40% have more than one comorbidity. And primary care, I know it's difficult. There's a lot of patients, they need a lot of things in a very short period of time. And there's no good assessment tools to quickly give a patient a survey and find the answer. When you think of pulmonary causes or cardiac causes, we think of many, many different, different causes. But when we think of acute onset, We've got to think of infections, reactive airway disease, PEs, MIs, pneumothorax, things we need to act on immediately. We've got to rule those out quick because those are things that can't wait. And so we'll start the workup usually focusing on those areas. And when patients are referred and then diagnosed with pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary arterial hypertension, they come to our centers and we sort out what the cause is. And when we look at the TRIO Health pH registry, enrolling patients from 2019 to 2020, we see the vast majority of our patients are still idiopathic, and many of them are surviving very long time, with a large portion of the patients in this study surviving more than 10 years. When they reach these centers, unfortunately, many of them are at intermediate risk and having functional class three symptoms. So we're not reaching them early enough, and we want to make whatever changes we can so we recognize things earlier. We need to have the right tools in our toolbox so we can detect earlier. Have we made a difference? Yes, we have, but we're still too slow in getting the patient to the right place, to the right team to care for them. If you look at how we've done compared to historical controls, if you look at the dashed line here, this is the NIH survival. And then we look fast forward to the reveal registry published in 2012, that our survival at every time point is better. With the NIH survival at three years of 46.9% and our survival based on reveal 74.5%. So we have made progress. We are making an impact, but we can move that needle even further. So when you look at pH specialists and how they are getting patients in, addressing and evaluating, there's a key group of people that help us. And that's our nurse coordinators, our nurse specialists, and our nurse practitioners. And the vast majority of programs have someone in that role. Of the 95 participants surveyed, 
only 10% did not have one of these individuals helping them in clinic. And they do vital roles. They're able to counsel, they're able to educate, and they're able to help in the medication initiation process. So this is part of what is offered in a pH expert center. So you don't only get the physician expertise and the right heart cath expertise, but you get this team of individuals who are working in concert for best outcomes for the patient. So let's walk through our patient. I'm gonna name her Nancy. She's 52, you know her. She's been seeing you for more than a year. She's never smoked. She's not on any estrogen. She has been seeing you for routine illness. She's on some hydrochlorothiazide for a mild hypertension. Blood pressure is 135 over 90. She goes up and down in her weight as many individuals do. And she's calling you, which is unlike her because she's short of breath. The reception knows her. She's a very nice lady. And she said, this is different. We need to get her in right away. So she gets on your schedule. So what's going through your mind? Well, you need to know, is this acute? We talked about those things we need to quickly fix. Or is this more subacute? And we'll need to figure that out on our exam and our history. So you bring her into the office. You take a look. She's worried. She's nervous. Her heart rate is 78, blood pressure 140 over 95, and her respiratory rate is 14. Her sets are 95% on room air. You listen to her and you notice something different. She has a regular rate and rhythm, but an accentuated P2 and a tricuspid murmur. That wasn't there last time. You know, because you have the same practice patterns. You listen to her lungs. She doesn't have crackles. Nothing new going on there. And you do an EKG. Right axis deviation. No signs of MI. So this is worrying you. This is different. So what do we think about? Will we, we look at symptoms? And we start to think, could this lady have pulmonary hypertension? New findings on cardiac exam and right axis deviation. So we ask about her dyspnea, her fatigue, her palpitations, any hemoptysis, abdominal distension, swelling, and even feelings of lightheadedness, presyncope or syncope. When we are really concerned about pulmonary hypertension, we're all look, also going to look for things of more advanced pulmonary hypertension, like exertional chest pain or hoarseness, which is compression of the recurrent laryngeal nerve by the enlargement of the pulmonary artery, or even sometimes things like cough and significant dyspnea, even at rest. So we're going to ask about those things because we need to gauge where we're at in this process. So we're looking for clinical signs. We're looking for clues. Our patient, as I mentioned, had a loud P2 and a tricuspid murmur but she could also have had more advanced symptoms of cyanosis. She could have had a diastolic murmur of pulmonic regurgitation. We just need to be aware of what to look for when we're thinking about pulmonary hypertension. When we see some more unusual signs, they could drive us to other causes of pulmonary hypertension. Do we see clubbing, cyanosis? Do we have crackles? Are they coarse? Are they fine? Do we have a whole bunch of telangiectasias? Or do we have changes concerning for connective tissue disease? Those will really help us because we need to know the why if we diagnose her with pulmonary hypertension. We don't want to see signs of right heart failure. She did not have this. She didn't have ascites. She didn't have edema. Her liver wasn't enlarged and it wasn't pulsatile. And she didn't have signs of low cardiac output state, cool extremities, pallor, dizziness. Those are urgent findings and need attention immediately. So we talked to her a little bit more. We want to know how this has happened and how fast it's happening. She says she can't exercise anymore. She stopped going to exercise classes. She can't even vacuum a whole room. She doesn't have chest pain that is routine, except when she climbs stairs. She's not wheezing. She's not coughing. She's not raspy. And she notes this has been slowly building over the last several weeks. So it's slow and onset. She looked up her symptoms on the internet, and she thought maybe it's anemia. So that's, of course, why she called, and she didn't realize that it was much more complicated when she got to the office. Okay, what do we do for her? Nancy needs help. Do we give her a bronchodilator? Do we give her some alprazolam, some beta blocker? Tell her to go and exercise? Give her some furosemide or nothing yet? It is tempting to do something, but in this case, we need to figure out the why of her symptoms. 
So let's go on for rapid evaluation. Look for the cause before empiric therapy. That would be the recommendation at this stage. So what do ERS ESC guidelines suggest for this workup? They recommend for patients who have concern for pulmonary hypertension to be referred to a pH center. If you have intermediate or high probability of pulmonary hypertension or risk factors or history of PE, these are patients that should be fast-tracked for referral. A comprehensive workup is recommended for everyone to look at the differential diagnosis and to find out what are the modifiable factors to help that patient. If there are warning signs, right heart failure, advanced symptoms, pre-syncope, syncope, urgent referral, possibly hospitalization should happen with rapid assessment. And an awareness and collaboration between the person seeing the patient and the pH center is imperative. So that seems like a lot, but hopefully we'll work through some framework here. So what are the signs we need to look for? Rapidly evaluating and advancing symptoms, signs of right heart failure, low cardiac output, poorly tolerated arrhythmias, or compromised hemodynamics. Those should ding, ding, ding in your head, tell you refer this patient for a prompt assessment. When you're looking at testing results, if you have significant RV dysfunction on echocardiogram, elevated BNP, hemodynamic instability, those are also signs that you should proceed quickly with referral or potentially hospitalization. So ERS ESC proposed an algorithm to work up patients who have dyspnea or suspected pulmonary hypertension, and it begins with the general practitioner. This is where we can make a huge difference and fast track patients. The first step is to evaluate the patient, a history, a physical exam, maybe an EKG, some labs and oxygen saturations. We got to suspect pulmonary hypertension. If you're seeing those worrisome signs, we got to go rapidly to an evaluation in a pH center. If symptoms are going quickly, if exercise capacity is going down fast, we're pre syncable or syncable with exertion. And if there's signs of right heart failure, we don't have time to wait. So we skip the whole algorithm and go straight to the pH center evaluation. But if they are more stable, we can take a little time and try to sort out why this is occurring in this individual. So now we need to detect. We need to look for lung causes or cardiac causes. And then we need to confirm. And that will be through the pH center. So if we're doing this workup, we'll usually go ahead and start with some routine testing maybe lung assessment, PFTs, and x-ray, but we'll also think about doing an echocardiogram, which is the backbone of the pH workup and detection. So if we can get an echo done earlier and we look at all of the parameters, we can improve that time to the diagnosis. So what are the key tools we use? What is in our toolbox for a pH evaluation? EKG, PFT, maybe cardiopulmonary exercise testing, BQ scanning, CT chest, echocardiogram, and diagnostic confirmation with the right heart catheterization. We also use biomarkers like BNP and NT pro BNP because they're very important to understand and risk assess. There's more tools coming down the pike, but right now those are our standard tools we use to assess a patient. And why does it take so long? because patients bounce around and symptoms are nondescript. Patients start with symptoms three plus years before they get to us. They see multiple primary cares and they see different specialists along the way. They get tests and it takes time to get the next test. And really what we can do to try to improve this is when we're thinking about pulmonary hypertension to then get our algorithm in our, in our minds, what we want to do and how we want to do it and not have that unnecessary delay between each visit or each evaluation. So how are we doing across the globe? Well, we find that everybody is experiencing the same kind of delay. In the Reveal, the French, the Swedish and Compare registry, the vast majority of patients are enrolling at functional class three. And it would be so wonderful if we could have patients 
meeting us at functional class two and staying at functional class two or one or two when we start therapy. So we see it here. We see it across the globe that this is an area we can improve upon. So as I mentioned, symptoms are nondescript. The most common symptom, shortness of breath with exertion. And I can name 10 other things that cause that. So it's not easy to figure this out, but it's putting your whole evaluation and all the information you know about the patient together and then coming out with this probability of pulmonary hypertension. So what's our next step for Nancy? Do we do some labs? Do we do a chest x-ray? Do we do a PFT or an echocardiogram? If we do them individually, they might take two to three weeks in between each one. Or do we do them all at the same time? I would argue we have enough concern. The symptoms are significant that we should do everything. So let's go through those things. Let's start with the labs. Her labs are a little bit off. Her sodium is a little bit low, 132. Actually, a, an at-risk sign for a patient with pulmonary hypertension. BNP is higher than normal. Also, risk sign. BNP is a marker of right ventricular stress, strain, and health of the right ventricle. So we use it in many of our risk assessment tools, which we'll discuss. BNP is a very important biomarker for our patients. So something we should consider adding to our workup when we're seeing a dysmic patient. Bilirubin is elevated 1.8. Maybe we have some liver congestion. Chest x-ray, clear lung fields, but prominent pulmonary arteries, lack of retrosternal airspace. PFTs, a low DLCO. That's concerning for pulmonary vascular disease. And our echocardiogram, significant abnormalities. So that is concerning. So let's talk about each one of those. Going back to our algorithm, we're here. We've seen our patient. We've done our routine tests. Now we're going down the cardiopulmonary evaluation and our echocardiogram has triggered concern. This is where we don't want to stop. We want to go on to the next step. We don't want to say she's anxious or maybe has asthma, even though our PFTs don't show anything and we haven't done a methicholine challenge. We don't want to blame this on deconditioning or elevated BMI because we didn't find anything that suggested that we found some other abnormalities we have to be respectful of. All right. What if there's normal testing, EKG, BNP, and chest x-ray? That does not rule out pulmonary hypertension. That just means that we're lucky to be meeting this lady at an earlier stage in her care. So what we're going to be looking for on the EKG, our right axis deviation, right ventricular hypertrophy, RV strain, things of that nature. The BNP may or may not be elevated. And the chest x-ray in our patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension should be clear, but big pulmonary arteries and maybe RV enlargement, and our patient with interstitial lung disease or COPD-related pulmonary hypertension should have appropriate changes. And then, as I mentioned, her echo was abnormal. What do we get from an echocardiogram? We get TR jet velocity, which is one of uh, the very important things that trigger a referral to us. And that is something that we have looked at over the years, and a TR jet velocity based on the ERS ESC guidelines of 2.8 or greater should be looked at as the cut point of abnormality. An estimated right ventricular systolic pressure of 35 or greater should raise concern, and ACC AHA recommended further evaluation at estimated pulmonary pressures of greater than 40. So all of these things taken into account. The TR jet 2.8 or more, or estimated pulmonary pressures in that 35, 40 range should take pause and then look for the potential causes. All right, how do we do this? How do we estimate this pressure? So we look at the leakiness of the tricuspid valve, that TR jet, and then we put it into a modified Bernoulli's equation. And with that, add the estimated right atrial pressure to obtain the pulmonary artery systolic pressure estimate. So there's a lot of places we can go wrong in this equation, but it is our best chance of getting a patient attention and making sure that they will be looked at further. But in addition to the TR jet velocity, we look at multiple other factors. So TR jet velocity is a backbone. That 2.8 cutoff is important but we also have to look at several other parameters on the echocardiogram to get the most benefit from that echo. We want to look, are the right ventricle changes present? 
Is the RV enlarged? Is it dysfunctional? We want to look at the pulmonary arteries, the RV outflow tract, if there's any changes in the acceleration time. Is there pulmonic regurgitation or is the pulmonary artery enlarged? Or when we look at the IVC, is it enlarged? Is it changing with respiration in the way it should be? Or is the right atrium enlarged? And we want to look at those parameters. And if there's at least two of the three abnormal, that actually increases our likelihood the patient has pulmonary hypertension. Now we're going to go through this because it is a little bit confusing and sometimes you just have to practice it a few times to get used to it. So if you look at the peak TR jet velocity, if you're in that 2.9 to 3.4 range, you're in that intermediate range. If you have other echo signs, two of the three groups, then you will be actually tracked to high probability of having pulmonary hypertension. So you move up one level of probability. And those patients that have signs or symptoms and that intermediate TR jet, as well as those patients who have a TR jet greater than 3.5, I'm sorry, 3.4, will track directly to right heart catheterization. So the other patients, we look at not only the echo signs, the TR jet, but also their history to try to drive to right heart catheterization or not. So a little bit complex, but important because we're not just stopping at that TR jet velocity. We're taking into account all the other important signs that the echo can provide to help tell us about the health of the right ventricle and the pulmonary pressures and the volume status. So let's go through those individually. Each panel tells us a story about the, the right heart and the pulmonary pressures. So the top panel seen here in the ERS ESC guidelines shows us about anatomic changes we might see in someone who has pulmonary hypertension or RV pressure or volume overload. So you see here in the parasternal long axis, we see an enlargement of the right ventricle. In the four chamber view, we can see enlargement of the right ventricle more than the left ventricle with that basal RV to LV ratio of greater than one. In the parasternal short, we see flattening of the septum, a D-shaped left ventricle. And when we look at the IVC, it could be dilated with decreased respirophasic changes. In this middle panel, we look at functionality of the right ventricle. We can see decreased right ventricular fractional area change, less than 35%. We can see a decreased TAPSI, less than 18 millimeters of mercury, or a decreased S prime of less than 9.5, all showing us that there's abnormality at the right ventricular function. And we can also look at the outflow tract and look at how fast the acceleration time is. If it's less than one point, sorry, less than 105 milliseconds and it has a mid systolic notch, it's concerning for pre capillary pulmonary hypertension. And then we can look at other important parameters in the last panel. We can look at RA size, we can look for pericardial effusions, and of course, we can look at our TR jet velocity. And if it's greater than 2.8, it's concerning for pulmonary hypertension. And we can look at the estimated pulmonary pressure when we add that to our estimated RIHO pressure to obtain that estimated pulmonary pressure overall. So very important findings from that echo that can't be overlooked. So let's go back to Nancy. We talked about her signs, her symptoms, and we talked about that her echo was abnormal. Her right ventricular systolic pressure was estimated at 55. She had right atrial enlargement and right ventricular enlargement. So she has elevated TR jet velocity and two of the three other parameters. So she is going to meet that high probability for pulmonary hypertension. So what do we do now? Do we say, we're done. We're going to give her some medication. Or do we do something else? So in this case, we haven't definitively diagnosed her. We are missing a huge part of this workup, the right heart cath. So pH is something we can suspect on evaluation. Echo is very helpful, but echo-derived pulmonary hypertension is not diagnostic, and we should not treat based on this. Specific therapies have been shown to harm people in other groups of pulmonary hypertension, and we don't want to cause delay in care or harm. Expert referral for that right heart catheterization should be considered because right heart catheterization is much more complicated than just checking a pressure. There's so much more we can glean from that test. So why is it so hard to find the needle in the haystack? 
our PAH patients. Why don't we want to miss this? Because they are a rare group, but we have great therapies that can impact their quality, quantity of life. And they get very easily lost in this sea of group two and group three patients. So a very important thing to do is really assess fully so we don't miss them. So let's go back to this dyspnea algorithm. We've gone to our workup. We've gone to our echocardiogram. We've watched for these warning signs, ready to rapidly refer if needed earlier. So now we're to our echo. And then we refer our patients. Because as I said, based on her echo, based on Nancy's echo, she had high probability of having pulmonary hypertension, but no real risk factors that we could find at this point. So she was diagnosed most likely with idiopathic PAH. Seen in an expert center, undergoes a right heart catheterization, and they did a vasodilator challenge. And the most commonly used agent is nitric oxide. Also, you could use inhaled iloprost if needed. And less strongly recommended would be IV ibuprofenol. It's a longer test, and there's multiple reevaluations that are needed when you use up titration of IV ibuprofenol. So it is recommended to use nitric oxide or inhaled iloprost. It is not recommended to use IV adenosine because it's poorly tolerated. So if she does that test, and if her pressures drop by 10 or more to a level of 40 or less without impairing cardiac output, she could be a calcium channel blocker therapy patient, but she did not have a positive response. She actually had a negative vasodilator challenge. So how do we make sure that we recognize the patients at risk? Nancy came, she's known to you. She tells you she's short of breath. She talked the correct way to help lead you to this diagnosis. But who do we watch for? Who should be on our radar of patients at risk? Well, our connective tissue disease patients, anybody who has a history of congenital heart disease, repaired shunts, people with drug or toxin exposure, liver disease, HIV, family history of PAH, those are high-risk patients. Idiopathic disease, like we're considering in Nancy, it's rare. We're going to most likely find pulmonary arterial hypertension or pulmonary hypertension associated with other conditions in the diseases we mentioned above. So what does PAH in the U.S. look like? Well, half of the patients diagnosed have idiopathic disease based on the reveal registry, and that was published in 2010, and the other half have associated conditions. Do you know what those associated conditions are? Do you know what's the most likely to be associated with PAH? Well, let's review that. So if we look at it, the vast majority of associated PAH are related to connective tissue disease. That's why if you have your scleroderma patients or your lupus patients, this has to be on your radar. In the other groups that follow are congenital heart disease, portal pulmonary hypertension, drug and toxin, HIV. So these are patients that should be asked about their dyspnea, their exercise tolerance, their functional capacity, and any other signs or symptoms of right heart dysfunction each time you see them so you can pick this up as early as possible. So how frequently should we be watching individual groups? Well, you don't want to do too much and you don't want to do too little. So we're going to go through the groups that are frequently screened and talk about how often we screen. Systemic sclerosis, one in every 10 systemic sclerosis patients develop pulmonary arterial hypertension during their lifetime. That's why they require yearly assessment. And we can do that in multiple ways, following multiple algorithms. We could do an echo annually with biomarkers or PFTs. We could do the detect rhythm algorithm. We could look at annual nt P with PFTs plus or minus echocardiograms. We just need to pick what way we want to monitor patients and do that yearly. And that can be done by the rheumatologist or possibly the pulmonary hypertension center. You just need to make sure your patient is being assessed for that. And they have someone they work with routinely or find them someone that can do that for them. Our portal pulmonary hypertension patients should be monitored with echocardiogram if liver transplant is being assessed. 
So your patient has liver disease and portal hypertension and echo is needed when they're looking for liver transplant. And then we assess them further based, based on results. Congenital heart disease patients, they need to be fully assessed at the time of consideration of repair. HIV only is symptomatic. VMPR2 mutation carriers, yearly echoes. They have a high risk of developing pulmonary hypertension during their lifetime, especially females with BMPR2 mutations. And previous anorexigen use, we use echocardiogram as a screening tool if they're symptomatic. So different groups of patients, different approaches, just be aware that these are the high-risk patients and we do different levels of screening for each type. So after you get the echo, what else would you want to do? These tests we talked about. A good physical exam, we can glean a lot of information from an exam. EKG, chest x-ray, PFTs, HRCD chest, ABGs, overnight pulse oximetries, and VQ scans. We're going to talk a lot about these now. So what is the data? Do we have data or are we just testing to test? We actually do have data to support different levels of evaluation for patients. So what is recommended? A solid echocardiogram as the first line non-invasive diagnostic investigation for suspected pulmonary hypertension. This will help us evaluate probability of pulmonary hypertension based on those echo parameters and TR jet velocity. And that cut up cutoff of TR jet velocity of greater than 2.8 is recommended. So based on availability of echo, we could consider additional testing if needed in the right clinical context. And certain patients would undergo cardiopulmonary exercise testing in the appropriate setting. But those are level 2A and 2B recommendations. So the really prime starting point is the echocardiogram. Okay, what about other testing? Class one evidence for VQ scanning, we need to evaluate for chronic thromboembolic disease. CTPAs, if we're looking at a patient who we have concern for chronic thromboembolic disease. And laboratory assessment, looking for hematology abnormalities, immunology abnormalities, HIV testing, thyroid function in all patients to assess their status and identify contributing conditions. And an abdominal ultrasound is class one recommendation because we're screening for portal hypertension. CT chest is oftentimes done as a 2A level C recommendation in all patients with pulmonary hypertension or could be more targeted in certain patient populations. And angiography in patients who are evaluating for a CTAP. So just know there's different levels of evidence for the testing we use, but the gold standard evaluation is our usual algorithm, including the echocardiogram to start, followed by labs, BQ, CT when we need it to work up, chronic thromboembolic disease, abdominal ultrasound, plus or minus additional testing. So the other thing we do for all of our patients when they're stable enough to complete is a pulmonary function test to evaluate their lung function as well as their diffusing capacity because it's very helpful to get a baseline study. The one thing that is not recommended is open lung biopsy. That can be very harmful to our patients and um, not well tolerated. So that is something we don't recommend to assess pulmonary vascular changes. So going back to how we get to the right tests and how we approach a patient, the biggest thing for all of us is to use the skills we have, our clinical assessment and our examination. And on our examination, we can determine a lot of information about a patient. In Nancy, it looked like she had mild changes with early pulmonary hypertension. Now, if you would have changes that would be consistent with right heart failure, hepatomegaly, pulsatile liver, ascites, JVD, HJR, and cool extremities, that would be a very different patient and required urgent assessment. Some of our patients will see changes that are concerning for connective tissue disease, prompting us to do that autoimmune workup earlier, get them to a rheumatologist as soon as we can while we're doing the additional workup. And if we hear those crackles, that's when our CT chest 
high resolution will be extremely helpful to evaluate for possible interstitial lung disease as etiology. So exam and history are very important to drive the tempo and the first, second, and third tests we do in rapid succession. So some other subtle things we might notice on exam if we're looking for them, we might see some digital cyanosis. We could have right to left shunting or advanced cardiopulmonary disease. We could have clubbing, which is rare in idiopathic PAH, but could be present in PBOD or congenital heart disease or liver disease. We could have fine rails on exam in the setting of pulmonary congestion with group two pulmonary hypertension, or it could be in early interstitial lung disease or changes such as pulmonary venal occlusive disease or capillary hemangiomatosis, which are rare, but things will need to prompt us to look more for them. If we have the right body habitus, significant kyphoscoliosis that could raise our concern for hypoventilation and prompt an ABG. Or as I mentioned, those changes concerning for connective tissue disease, we don't want to ignore them. Patients need to get to a rheumatologist for an evaluation. We can start with the autoimmune workup because sometimes finding, evaluating, and treating the symptoms of their connective tissue disease will help their dyspnea or their other symptoms a great deal. Also, we want to look at the extremities, see if there's an imbalance in the edema or other changes concerning for chronic DVT, which would prompt us additional workup for thromboembolic disease. So now let's look at these tests individually. And it seems a bit overwhelming. There's a lot of information, but these are routine tests that you do every day. Let's start with the x-ray. Okay, you look at this x-ray, it's pretty, pretty clear. No acute cardiopulmonary disease is what you're going to see on the read. But you look at it, there's a paucity of vessels in the periphery. That right ventricle is right up against the sternum with lock, last, sorry, loss of retrosternal airspace to, in this, on this lateral view. This would be concerning for pulmonary hypertension. So something that we should be aware of and should prompt our attention to pulmonary hypertension. So looking at the CT, maybe clear lung fields, but look how big the pulmonary artery is, how big the right ventricle is to the left ventricle. And if you look at these ratios, the pulmonary artery to the aorta, if it's one or greater, or that RV to LV is 1.2 or greater, there is a sensitivity up to 94% and a positive predictive value up to 91% that this person could have elevated pulmonary pressures. It's not going to tell you exactly what kind, but it's going to tell you that this person likely is experiencing some elevated pulmonary pressures for some reason. So just prompting you to look more down the route of pulmonary hypertension. On the VQ scan, this is a tool that many of us used in the past for our QPE workup, but this is used in pulmonary hypertension for chronic PE. So you look at the top panel here, this is ventilation. You see equal distribution of the radio labeled substance the patient is breathing in, and then it washes out, normal. But you look here at the bottom two panels and you see that the perfusion is patchy. There's areas of the lung that is not perfused well. This is concerning for an abnormality of perfusion that could be related to chronic thromboembolic disease. And in this patient, you would go on to a, a CT with contrast for better evaluation of possible chronic thromboembolic disease. So now putting what we learned and applying it to Nancy. So we talked about PFTs, VQs, chest CTs, and then we also mentioned a little bit about pulse oximetry. Nancy, her PFTs were preserved mechanics, but a low DLCO, concerning for pulmonary vascular disease. Her VQ, look at it here, beautiful, nice perfusion without any significant abnormalities. So no concern for chronic thromboembolic disease by VQ. And a normal VQ is very good at ruling out chronic thromboembolic disease. CT chest, she has a big pulmonary artery, but the parenchyma otherwise is pretty normal and the right atrium and right ventricle is enlarged. She had some mild hypoxemia with sleep, but she did a polysomnogram and no significant OSA. So she's going down the route. She's doing all the tests she needs to do. So you talk to her a little bit more. You discuss her results. 
And she tells you, no, I talked to my sister and I had an aunt that had a lung problem and she died at a young age and she was going to get some more information. And this is starting to prompt you to be concerned about heritable pulmonary hypertension. So you're like, please try to get as much information and see if you can get any records or autopsy results. And in the meantime, I'm going to refer you to an expert pulmonary hypertension center so you can undergo additional testing to confirm if you do have pulmonary hypertension or not. The very important step. Okay, so now we're here. We're ready to diagnose this young lady with pulmonary hypertension if she, if she has elevated pulmonary pressures. Performing the right heart cath requires expertise. It's not a five-minute procedure. It requires multiple different parameters to be done in a standardized way to get best results and to compare over time. These are necessary for diagnosis, follow-up, and to look for patients when they're being considered for heart or lung transplant and to evaluate congenital heart disease. So a lot of different roles that right heart catheterization plays, but for us, really important that it be done in a certain way to get the right information for a pulmonary hypertension diagnosis. Interpretation is challenging. And every time you get a right heart catheterization, we look at the tracings and verify that we agree with the read that comes along with that right heart catheterization. The most feared and most dangerous complication of a right heart catheterization is, right, is pulmonary artery perforation. It is very rare, but we need to be aware that this is a potential complication that can happen and we need to prepare the patient for all the different things that can happen with this procedure. So why can't we just use an echo to estimate the pulmonary pressures? Well, we can get an estimate of the pulmonary pressure, but it is not as reliable as we would like. And we're not going to fully understand cardiac output and filling pressures just with echocardiogram. So let's look at echocardiogram compared to right heart cath pulmonary pressures. The green is same day, the aqua is one to one, one month, and the light blue is one to three months. So same day echocardiogram underestimates 30%, within 10 points, 40%, and overestimates more than 30%. So we're only within those 10 points about 40% of the time, even when we do it on the same day. So it's helpful. It's a powerful tool to establish risk of pulmonary hypertension, but should not be used to confirm that pulmonary pressure. So what else do we get other than pressure from a right heart cath? This is why it's so important. It gives us that pressure, but it also gives us cardiac output. It gives us the wedge pressure to tell us about left-sided filling pressures, right atrial pressure, right ventricular pressure, and then we calculate things from it. Transpulmonary gradient, diastolic pressure gradient, we look at pulmonary vascular resistance, and this is what gives us a whole picture of how well our patient is doing and what is the cause hemodynamically of their pulmonary pressure elevations. So recommendations regarding right heart cath. What does ERS ESC recommend? Class one, level B evidence, right heart cath is, is, recommendation, is recommended to confirm the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension and to support treatment. So this is something that's necessary in all of our patients. It's recommended to be performed in expert centers and should include a whole set of hemodynamic parameters for the best information. So just as we talked about, expert center diligently performed and a full set of data that can be compared over time. So why do I say that it's not easy? Well, let me show you just one piece of it that is complicated, that can absolutely change the result of your right heart catheterization if you don't go through this process. When you see a patient and you perform a right heart catheterization, this needs to be done in a, in a location that really understands the importance of zeroing, assessing, keeping the patient comfortable, but not too sedated, and that they're able to accurately wedge the patient to obtain those left-sided filling pressures. And the wedge pressure is not the average that the computer is generating. It is the pressure in the lungs when the lungs are at exhalation, not a forced exhalation, just comfortable at rest when you have the least amount of 
external pressures changing that wedge pressure. And so you see here in this tracing, the patient inhales, exhales at the end of exhalation. We look at the mean of the A wave, and that's what we use as our wedge pressure. And this is not to be done over and over and over, but we want to have a measurement of at least three and look at the mean of those to use as our wedge pressure to calculate all of our other parameters. Wedge sometimes is not enough though. And if we looked at several studies that showed us that occasionally wedge, if done, even in expert centers, can over or underestimate our left-sided filling pressures. And many patients are assessed on their initial right heart catheterization with the addition of a left ventricular and diastolic pressure to confirm that filling pressure. Because you can see here that many patients are misclassified as pulmonary venous hypertension or pulmonary arterial hypertension based on wedge alone. So if you approach a patient and you offer right heart catheterization, this is something to consider, to consider the addition of a left and diastolic pressure to confirm that filling pressure on the first assessment to make sure you classify correctly. An additional thing that can be done is a wedge saturation to prove that you're, you're fully wedged and obtaining that wedge number accurately. So just something to think about. And many of us in expert centers use these things like wedge pressures with wedge saturations, as well as LVDP intermittently. So the other thing to know is when our patients are really scared about doing these procedures, that it is not always done in the way it was in the past. In addition to the internal jugular or the femoral approach, there's also the antecubital approach, which is sometimes easier for patients, quicker recovery time, and they require less sedation. So just make them aware that this is a potential option for the patient in certain, certain circumstances and has been used successfully in pulmonary hypertension evaluation. So there are some contraindications to be aware of, mechanical tricuspid or pulmonic valves, right heart masses, or right-sided endocarditis. We should not be doing right heart catheterizations in those settings. Relative contraindications that most of the time can be overcome are coagulopathies, pacemakers, bioprosthetic valves, left bundle branch block, arrhythmias, or site infections. So if we have a skin infection, we'd go to a new location. If we have arrhythmias, we'd treat that first, and the others we would adapt and learn how to do those casts in that individual patient as safely as possible. And why do we want this done in an expert center? I showed you, it's not, it's not as easy as I would love for it to be. Um, and patients are misclassified when they come to us. So a patient may have gotten a partial assessment and be given a diagnosis of pulmonary arterial hypertension or pulmonary venous hypertension. And when reevaluated, oftentimes their diagnosis will change. And in this look at 140 patients seen consecutively in a pH center over a 10 month period, they found that patients oftentimes change their diagnosis after further workup. If you look at this group one panel, we have 73% of the patients who reached the center had the correct diagnosis, but many others did not. There were patients in group two, group three, and even no pulmonary hypertension that were incorrectly diagnosed as their pre-referral diagnosis. So just be aware that this is really important that we refer patients early and then that some testing has to be repeated or reevaluated to make sure we're on target with our diagnosis so we can treat the patient best as possible. So let's go back to Nancy. We talked more to her family. Her aunt actually passed away of right heart failure and they were able to find an autopsy report that showed plexiform lesions. And so she was actually diagnosed with heritable pulmonary arterial hypertension. And this is important because it impacts the rest of her family and also plays a role in her risk assessment. So important findings for Nancy and that will go on to genetic counseling and counseling of family members. So what do we know about heritable pulmonary hypertension? 75% of patients with known history of pH and families being affected 
carry the mutation for BMPR2. Other mutations have been found, but this is the most common. And patients with BMPR2 mutation develop PAH at a younger age, and there's variable penetrance. 42% of females are affected by PAH when they have a BMPR mutation, and only 14% of males. But as I mentioned earlier, these patients should be followed annually for the development of pulmonary hypertension. Watch carefully. And if there's change in symptoms, they could even be evaluated sooner than that year period. And we should consider genetic counseling for these individuals to be able to offer more of their family members screening and assessment. So if you think about Nancy and you think about her workup, let's say there are some variations on her presentation or her results. What would change if she would have had a positive VQ scan with multiple defects? How would that have prompted different workup? Well, we would be concerned for chronic thromboembolic disease. Just because your VQ is abnormal doesn't mean you necessarily have chronic thromboembolic disease, but it means that you need to work it up. And she would have either gone on to pulmonary angiography or a CT with contrast for further delineation of her pulmonary vascular bed. And if she had chronic PE, then we would work with the a chronic thromobolic pulmonary hypertension expert center, which may not even be in that pH expert center, but there we work together on several patients across different programs, depending on what we need. So that's very important. So the VQ positivity would have changed our management. How would we treat Nancy? Well, specific therapy would be initiated because we said this is extremely important that we don't delay but we'll base it on her risk assessment, severity of disease and results. So we'll go through that in a bit. And what changes in her exercise capacity should we expect when we initiate therapy? Will it happen overnight? No, these therapies take some time for the effects to occur. So we don't wanna give people the thought that they're gonna be better overnight. Oftentimes it takes six to eight weeks for full effect of the medications. Each medication is different. Some are faster in onset, some are slower onset, but this is why we don't reevaluate in 24, 48 hours, but we allow time between our visits to have the medications have best effect. So what additional interventions should we consider? What general measures in addition to consideration of these special pulmonary hypertension medications, should we offer patients like Nancy? Well, we used to offer everyone anticoagulation, but that's only considered optional in some idiopathic heritable or drug and toxin induced patients at this time. So we look at risk of bleeding, risk of benefit, and we weigh those risk versus benefit and only initiate in select patients. There are patients we avoid anticoagulation, which would be patients with associated conditions like scleroderma because of increased risk of bleeding. So very different approach than it was 10 years ago. We recommend cardiopulmonary rehab and increasing exercise tolerance in our patients. And we really want to collaborate with our referring physicians, our expert centers for other things that we may need for our patient, a transplant center a CTEF center, and we all really have to work together to be able to allow patients to have the best outcomes. So I talked about those general measures that we should employ for all of our pulmonary arterial hypertension patients, and they come in all different flavors. For patients with childbearing potential, we want to avoid pregnancy because of adverse outcomes for mom during pregnancy and the shifts in volume and fluid. They're especially at risk post-delivery. So this is something we need to counsel about and be prepared to address in, the, in those individual patients. We want to vaccinate. We want to provide psychosocial support. This is a very stressful illness. We want to supervise trained exercise and allow all of our patients to have option to access that, whether virtually or in person, cardiopulmonary rehab. We want to provide oxygen when patients are hypoxemic and work together with anesthesia for any 
planned procedures or urgent procedures. We want to use diuretics when patients are volume overloaded, oxygen with hypoxemia, anticoagulation on an individual basis, treat iron deficiency, but avoid medications like ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, unless there's a specific indication. We don't use left heart failure management unless there's left heart failure to address and treat arrhythmias when they occur. And we use these supportive measures for all of our patients, but we tailor them to each individual based on their needs. All right, so let's go back to this algorithm for workup. We're going to talk about how to evaluate a patient like Nancy. So for our idiopaths, heritable, and drug and toxin patients, they are recommended to undergo vasodilator challenges, as we mentioned. But if they're negative, they then go on to the algorithm for further treatment. So what are the treatments? So there's two pathways, those patients like Nancy without comorbidities and those with comorbidities. And the patients with comorbidities, we have to treat in a way that watches them very closely so we don't exacerbate any other medical problems when we treat them. And those require a different level of, of attention, but we're really going to concentrate on those without cardiopulmonary comorbidities. And what do we recommend? To risk stratify. And when we risk stratify a newly diagnosed patient, it'll be a three strata model. Lots of parameters looking at heart, lung, and exercise capacity, as well as hemodynamics and echo findings and putting it all together to determine the patient's risk. When they're lower intermediate risk, we go up with dual upfront combination therapy with a PDE5 and an endothelin receptor antagonist. If they're high risk, we don't waste time. We go straight to oral therapy plus parenteral prostacyclines. That is necessary to get them back on track in terms of the right heart function and functionality. So we don't wait and reassess. We go directly to parenteral prostacyclines in those individuals. So, you know, we talk about this, we have nice algorithms, but what's actually happening in the real world? Well, that was looked at with an Adelphi pH disease specific program using US surveys. And they enrolled 69 healthcare providers. And they looked at more than 300 patients that were enrolled. And they found that 20 to 25% of patients didn't even get the right heart cath they needed. And other patients didn't get any therapy. So what caused this? What were the triggers? Well, I want you to look at two things here. This aqua line is the patients who were treated. The green lines are those who were not treated. So what was present in those patients who received treatment? More often, PAH was considered the main health concern. They had more dyspnea, fatigue, and swelling. And they had commercial insurance. Those who were not treated, PAH was felt less of a health concern. They were less symptomatic. They had limited disease knowledge and they had non-commercial insurance. So something for us really to think about. We can intervene on some of these things. We can improve patient knowledge of their disease process. We need to work with them and work with tools to educate at whatever level that patient needs. And then we need to try to take out any commercial or non-commercial insurance biases that may be occurring. And we need to be aware that this is happening so we can address it in our own patients if we find that it is occurring. So important information to, for us to be aware of. So now let's talk about that risk assessment. I told you that we risk assess to determine two oral drugs versus two oral drugs plus a parental process cycling. We want to risk assess with the goal of getting our patients to low risk status. So what can we do to make that happen? And why is it so important? Well, we need to put into our daily regimen when we're seeing patients. And what do we gain, gain from that? When we reach lower risk status, our patients do better in the moment and long-term. If you look at the reveal registry, those patients who reached Functional class two, which is a big part of our follow-up reassessment risk assessment, 
they had better life expectancies. And if you look at survival rates, those with functional class one and two, 78% were alive at three years versus only 55% of those with more advanced symptoms. So this plays a major role. So we need to look at them globally using risk assessment. And how do we do risk assessment? Multi-parametric approach. We look at hemodynamics. We look at echocardiograms. We look at our risk assessment tools. We look at our biomarkers. We look at our evaluation and our exercise capacity. And all of that together in our visit needs to compute and we need to then provide guidance to the patient on next steps to make their risk lower for worsening and for mortality. So we're back here and we're gonna go through those risk assessment tools quickly and just show you the difference in the approach at diagnosis, at baseline and at follow-up because it is very different. The initial assessment is broader, encompasses more parameters and then follow-up is more rapid and quickly we can adjust doses of medications based on findings. All right, so our initial risk assessment is three strata. We're gonna risk assessment, we're gonna risk assess to low, intermediate, or high risk. And we're gonna look at parameters like heart failure, progression, syncope, functional class, walk distance, exercise capacity, biomarkers, echo findings, MRI when completed, and hemodynamics. And we're going to try to assess how likely this patient is going to be with us in one year. And those high-risk patients have a mortality risk of greater than 20%, whereas our low-risk patients, less than 5%. So you can kind of see why we could choose medications differently based on how severe their illness is. Now, when we see our patients in follow-up, we'll do a much more direct approach but it'll be a four strata model because we want to make sure those intermediate patients are seen and we sort out who is low intermediate and who's higher intermediate. And we're going to look at only three factors, functional class, walk distance, and biomarkers. And we're going to give each a score and then divide it by the number of those scores we had. And that will tell us what risk the patient is. And then we can put it back in that algorithm to determine what we need to do about their medications to achieve low risk status. So seems complicated, but this will take two or three minutes and could, can easily be adapted into a routine follow-up visit for a pulmonary arterial hypertension patient. So say you don't wanna use ERS, ESC, that's okay. We have lots of options. And one very nice option based on the REVEAL registry is the REVEAL 2.0 risk assessment. Many times patients undergo this assessment at diagnosis. You receive a score for multiple parameters. Some are non-modifiable, like age and type of pulmonary hypertension you have, and then modifiable, like blood pressure, heart rate, walk distance, BNP. And then you receive that score, and then you're classified as low, intermediate, or high risk. And we can use that same information to guide treatment strategies. On follow-up, there's an option of a shorter calculator, the Reveal Light 2 risk calculator. Again, looking at factors that are quickly obtainable, BNP, walk distance, functional class, blood pressure, heart rate, and our GFR. And with that, we can risk assess, and then a patient will land in the low, intermediate, or high risk category. So another easy tool that can be implemented to follow patients and use that to adjust medications. So how do we follow patients? Well, it's not just see them once and then see them a year later. Knowing what we just talked about for risk assessment, there are several things we have to do at every visit. We need to see them. We need to assess them. We need to assess their functional class, their walk distance, or their BNP. ERS, ESC recommends EKGs. ECHO is most visits, um, but may be considered more frequently when appropriate. Oximetry at every visit. Healthcare quality of life assessment should be considered. Cardiopulmonary exercise also should be considered when appropriate. And then right heart cast, diagnosis, change in therapies, and if any, worsening. So really important help in terms of putting categories on when we should be repeating tests to be able to repeat risk assess. So important data. So risk assessment, 
I hope it wasn't overwhelming in terms of the number of parameters, but I think really what needs to happen is to sit with it, use it, and get more comfortable with it, and you can then quickly add it to your routine assessment. pH is a severe condition. We don't have great ways to assess how we're doing unless we do a standard approach with a risk assessment tool. Recent progress has been made because we've been assessing patients and treating and escalating therapy based on their risk assessment. And we know if we change that risk score and we lower it, we can have better outcomes in terms of quality and quantity of life. There are several limitations to these risk assessment models, but they're the best tools we have at this point, but should be used in context. We should be using them with our right ventricular assessment and our clinical assessment to have a big package that we can use to guide therapies and medication recommendations. So they're not the whole answer, but they're a very essential part of our evaluation. So I want you to remember one important thing, that patients can get derailed. They can go off and forget to follow up. We need to work very hard once we think somebody has pulmonary hypertension to keep them on track. Delays and errors in the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension is a common problem. We saw that it can take several years to diagnose a pulmonary hypertension patient in several studies and re registries. Echo helps us, but it's much more than just the TR jet velocity and the right ventricular systolic pressure. And most likely when patients come to us with elevated pressure, it's going to be group two or three, but that's okay. We have some treatments for those individuals and we can help them also. So it's a win for them also. It's very important that right heart catheterizations be done in an expert center so we can get all the data we need to be able to classify properly and follow properly. And management in an expert center is extremely important because of all the tools and individuals that are needed for best outcomes. So we talked a lot about what we're going to do, what we want our referring team out in the community to do with us. But let's talk about what the patient is experiencing. They may feel very differently. They're stressed. This has been a lot of appointments. They have testing fatigue. They're worried about hospitalization. They haven't been able to work. We need to be able to communicate what a risk assessment tool is, why we are doing all of these tests so they can understand that we are trying to work with them for best outcomes in terms of their exercise capacity and delay in worsening. So I think once we open that line of communication and we educate, it will be a better experience for the patient and they will understand why they're working so hard to do all of these things and that is really for their best outcomes. So we've got to marry these factors and it sometimes can be difficult. We've got to marry what we want. We want to know about exercise tolerance and symptoms and biomarkers and hemodynamics. And what does the patient want? They want to know about quality of life, how this is impacting their education, their finances, their social and mental health. And we need to make sure they understand that our goal is really their goal to become more functional and achieve independence with ADLs they may have lost during acute illness. And we have to be sensitive to individual patient needs. Not every patient is the same. They will come from different backgrounds, different level of education, and different understanding of medications and medical testing. They may be very accomplished, but really have not accessed healthcare in their life before. So we need to step back and make sure we make this a level playing field for all of our patients so their experience can be the best it can be. So we've got to be aware that we are not equal to all patients. There is significant, significant differences in what we know about certain races and ethnicities, patients that are rural, and these factors affect outcomes. There's no specific treatment algorithm that includes these things. And as you just saw, I didn't mention any of this before. We have to be aware and make sure we're checking ourselves that we are addressing all patients and their individual needs. We do have some holes in what we understand. White patients 
in registries, including the reveal registry, were significantly older than other races and ethnicities. Black patients were 2.5 times more likely to have PAH associated with connective tissue disease. And congenital heart disease was more common in Asians and Hispanics. So each group has different risk factors and different disease processes we need to keep in mind. The other thing is patients aren't represented in our clinical trials and registries. Black patients make up only 2 to 7% of randomized clinical trials and only 12% of reveal. So we don't fully understand how this disease process may be a little bit different in different groups of patients. And some randomized controlled trials don't even report race. So important things to be aware of. And our patients likely are seeing this on social media and this may affect their choices and medications. So you see here, the green bars are Caucasian or white patients. And you'll see that most of these studies and registries are full of green bars. And so we need to actively look at this in our patient population and make sure we offer clinical trials and registries to all patients in the same way and have no preconceived notions about who's gonna say yes or who it's gonna to be too much of a burden for. So I think this is something that we need to consciously be aware of. And if we're not aware, we can't make any change in how we interact with the world of pulmonary hypertension we live in or the world in our primary care offices. So racial disparities in pulmonary hypertension exist and we need to ask questions, look at factors that may be associated with poor outcomes, lack of transportation, financial difficulties, things of that nature, ask questions. Be ready to act on the responses to be able to support that patient through this journey of their pulmonary hypertension care. So in conclusion, clinicians should be aware that pulmonary hypertension is a common condition associated with both heart and lung disease. Group one pulmonary hypertension is much less common, but more prevalent in at-risk patients. Scleroderma, uncorrected congenital heart disease, HIV, drug and toxin exposed patients, they have big risk and we have to be aware of that. Workup for pulmonary hypertension should include echocardiography and diagnosis with right heart catheterization. Definitive diagnosis of PAH requires that confirmed right heart catheterization with a mean pressure of greater than 20 with that full parameter of data to allow us to properly assess and classify the patient. Current treatment algorithms recommends most appropriate initial strategy and we base change in therapy or number of therapies on how well the patient is doing. And we do that by risk assessment. And we need to do that at baseline and with every visit. And patients should be referred early to expert centers and urgently if they're having severe symptoms so that they can be afforded a rapid evaluation and initiation and medications to help them achieve low risk status and best outcomes. So with that, I want to thank you for joining me. I do really appreciate your time, and I want to direct you to the Simply Speaking PH Lecture Library at practicepointcme.com to complete your evaluation and receive your CME credit.